Uh, welcome everybody to Probability and Analysis webinar. It's our great pleasure to have Hao Jian Li from Baylor University, and she is going to talk about complete logarithmic Sobolev inequalities. Please, Hao Jian, feel free to start. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm so happy to give this talk, and uh, hopefully I can meet everyone soon in person. Uh, today I'm going to talk about complete logarithmic Sobolev inequalities. And okay, so first I want to start with quantum systems. Uh, we can never perfectly isolate a quantum system from its surrounding environment. And that's why we always want to study open quantum systems. I mean, closed quantum systems can be a very good prototype example, but it's not that realistic. So, um, Let's start with open quantum system. As I mentioned, the quantum system will interact with its environment. So now the question is, how do we describe this kind of uh, interaction? Or how do we describe the dynamical evolution of an open quantum system? And this kind of dynamical evolution, it, it can be described by a quantum Markov semigroup, which is the first part of today's talk. After that, it's not enough. I mean, um, uh, an open quantum system will interact with the environment. That is to say, it will lose some energy or lose some information. So a good quantum state will finally decline or reduce to something boring, like a classical quantum state or equilibrium state. And uh, we want to quantitize or we want to study how fast this quantum state will become boring. And this kind of speed can be described by complete logarithmic sublet inequalities, which is uh, the second part of today's talk. Uh, and we are going to go beyond that. We, I will also introduce some other functional inequalities, uh, such as Beckner inequalities, which are closely related to uh, complete logarithmic sublet inequalities. Finally, I will summarize some recent results. Uh, so since CLSI is still a relatively young subject, I will basically just summarize uh, some like uh, results of two groups or three groups. Um, if time permits, I will uh, mention some open problems. I invite everyone to think about those open problems. And let's get started with quantum Markov semigroup. So today we restrict ourselves to a finite Riemannian algebra with a normal physical trivial state. If you are not familiar with Riemannian algebra, you can think of this M um, as uh, some finite dimensional, as a, a family of finite dimensional matrices. And this tau, the trace, uh, you can think of that as the normalized trace. And uh, a quantum Markov semigroup, it is a unital, completely positive semigroup, which satisfies some continuity condition. Here, I don't want to read like every condition, uh, every piece of condition of uh, QMS, quantum Markov semigroup. Uh, but we can, you can think of quantum Markov semigroup as a non-commutative version of the classical Markov semigroup. Um, also, if we replace this M by some L infinity space, this will become a classical Markov semigroup. And uh, we want to study a very nice uh, QMS, which is symmetric. That is to say, for every time T, this T sub T, it is a self adjoint operator. For such QMS for such quantum Markov semigroup, we can always find a generator. And today, again, we only focus on symmetric quantum Markov semigroup defined on a finite Riemann algebra. So I think the whole definition is kind of complicated. Uh, I want to mention um, uh, an example, which is basically the most classical example of quantum Markov semigroup. So um, this example is also called the GKS in the blood theorem. It tells us, um, so 
So the theorem tells us uh, the quantum Mach, the, the dynamical evolution of any quantum system can be described by this kind of semigroup where the Lindblad operator can be written as, um, as a summation of two parts. So the first part is the, uh, it, the first part is like a commutator where we call this H. Uh, so this H is self adjoint. The second part is more like a double commutator. Yeah, and since today we only focus on a symmetric QMS, we are going to further simplify this. That is to say, we only focus on the generator uh, defined as a double commutator where V sub J, it is self adjoint. Uh, so I think this is still kind of like a, not uh, uh, concrete enough. And we are going to look at a more concrete example. We only consider one double commutator where V sub J or V sub one is given by the poly matrix Z. Here I'm using the uh, notation sigma three. Uh, sigma three is like this. So then we can write down the generator, which, um, the, the generator L, which is the double commutator where this lambda is a positive number. And then we can also write down the uh, Malkov semigroup generated by L. So the Malkov semigroup will act like this. So it will only act on the off diagonal term. And if T goes to infinity, these two off diagonal terms will go will go to zero, so they will want vanish. And the diagonal term doesn't change, they will stay invariant. And this is a very interesting example because it tells us the invariant state of this quantum Malkov semigroup is not unique. And any diagonal matrix can be, is an invariant state. And we call such kind of dynamical uh, semi-group, quantum Markov semi-group, non-ergodic. And uh, we are going to talk about this one more time. So this is more like, uh, this is very different from quantum, from classical Markov semi-group, because when we study the quant classical Markov semi-group, we usually focus on the ergodic Markov semi-group. That is to say, there is a unique invariant state. And this is very different from that. And this is like also why the study of QMS is so challenging. Uh, any questions? Okay, then maybe I can go to the second part. So the second part is um, the functional inequalities. Uh, first, let me remind you uh, our topic today. So uh, our subject today, today, it is the symmetric quantum Markov semigroup. Yeah, and the generator is A. We are going to study such QMS on a finite Manuman algebra. And as we, we've seen before, the invariant state is not unique anymore. It's not even unique up to a scalar. So instead of studying the unique invariant state, we need to define an algebra where every element in this algebra is invariant under the quantum Markov semigroup. And we call such algebra the fixed point algebra. And it is quite clear from the name, every element in this algebra is fixed or invariant under the QMS. And since we have a smaller algebra, we can also define the conditional expectation from the finite Manuman algebra to the smaller algebra. And here we have a question. So um, for every uh, quantum state, we can define E of rho. For, uh, by saying a quantum state, Usually, I mean um, a positive or semi-positive matrix with uh, trace one with trace one. And um, actually here you can see, I didn't require that rho and sigma must be trace one because uh, relative entropy, it can also be defined for other like non-trace one positive elements, but you can always like restrict everything to trace one matrices. It doesn't like, uh, influence the study uh, of the functional inequalities. 
And here um, we have a quantum state, which is rho. By saying a quantum state, again, I mean a positive matrix. We want to study how fast this quantum state will decay to E of rho. The best thing to expect is it will decay exponentially. And um, that's, so we call this kind of exponential decay modified logarithmic sublimit inequality. Then let me just break down, uh, break everything. Uh, then let me just elaborate the details. So we want to study some exponential decay. First, we need a distance to describe everything. And the distance we are using today is called relative entropy. So the relative entropy, it is more like a distance measure between rho and the sigma. Here, rho and the sigma, they are both positive uh, matrices. And it is defined as trace of rho log rho minus rho log sigma. And um, so actually it, the, the definition is more complicated than this because it might be not well defined. Um, you can understand this definition like this. If it is well defined, it is well defined. If it's not well defined, we are going to apply two rules, like zero, zero log zero is considered to be zero. If it's still not well defined, um, the relative entropy is just infinity. And we always like to consider uh, well defined everything which is well defined. But this is not a distance measure because d rho sigma is not equal to d sigma rho. And today we want to study the distance between rho and E of rho. That is to say, we are going to replace sigma by E of rho. As I mentioned, we expect this decay would be exponential decay. So we want to have the following uh, inequality, like uh, this inequality, like the distance will decay exponentially where lambda is the decay rate. If for every quantum state, we have such inequality, we say this quantum Markov semigroup satisfies a lambda MLSI. And that's, this is more related to physical uh, background, but it's different from the inequality in our title because in the title, we want it, it is complete LSI instead of modified LSI. And now I'm going to define complete LSI. To define that, we need one more definition, which is called Fisher information. Fisher information is also called entropy production. It is defined as A of rho log rho. Here, A is the generator of the quantum Markov semigroup. And uh, this Fisher information, it is always positive and it is the negative decay rate of relative entropy. And this identity, it is also called de Bruging identity or de Bruging formula, which is very important. Later, we are going to generalize Fisher information and relative entropy by using this formula. And here, um, Okay, so then we are ready to introduce uh, CLSI. We say a semigroup satisfies lambda MLSI if lambda relative entropy is smaller than Fisher information for arbitrary positive rho. And if we have this inequality for every semigroup, for every T sub T tensor identity over arbitrary finite binomial algebra, we say this semigroup satisfies uh, CLSI. So now I think um, there are several questions that I have to answer. The first question is, is this well-defined? Because relative entropy, it is usually positive. I think um, relative entropy is also like well-studied in probability and it, satis it share this relative, relative entropy shares many uh, qualities with the entropy in probability, like the classical one. And this is positive. First, we want to make sure facial information is also positive 
to make sure it is well defined? The answer is yes. Yeah, and this facial information, it is positive. But the question is, I only know one proof using double operator integral. I don't know any like uh, elementary proof. So, and I think there should be some elementary proof. If you know it, please let me know. I really appreciate that. Yeah, and the second question is, um, this is also called Lambda MLSI, which is different from what we've seen before. We've seen like this exponential decay, it is Lambda MLSI. And this is also has the same name. Are they the same thing? Uh, I'm going, actually they are the same thing. They are equivalent. And now there is one more question, like why do we even study this concept, like this subject? Is it the same as Lambda MLSI? Like, are they the same? If they are not the same, do we know any examples? Or what can we get by studying a more complicated inequality? And now we are going to answer those questions. First, um, the exponential decay and uh, the second definition, they are equivalent. I think this is also well known for LSI. Um, the second thing is, so in today's, um, so when we study CLSI, we actually study something like stronger than CLSI itself. We studied the exponential decay of facial information. And this is stronger than MLSI. And also if you study the, exponential decay of A tensor some identity, uh, it is stronger than CLSI. This is the subject we actually work on when we try to figure out CLSI. The next thing is, do, do, what can we say about C, the constant, CLSI constant, MLSI constant? Uh, are they related to some known uh, inequalities? So first, let's, let me define the constants. We use M, uh, we are going to define MLSIA and CLSIA as the supremum of the corresponding inequalities. First, MLSI, the constant of MLSI, it is upper bounded by a uh, spectral gap, uh, aka Poincare inequalities. Uh, so here um, there is a two, I mean, it, it depends on how you scalar uh, the inequality, how you define the inequality. Next thing is CLSI, it is smaller than MLSI. This is um, obvious from the definition because if we, let, if we let this F be identity, like be C, like complex numbers, then they are the same. So CLSI, it is stronger than MLSI. And um, so, um, so we have this smaller than or equal to. So I think the question is, can we find some example where CLSI is strictly smaller than MLSI? And this example was given by uh, Brand, uh, Mike Brennan, Legal, and Marius Junger two years ago. Um, uh, they, uh, they, so they studied the maximally entangled quantum state of this depolarizing semi-group. And uh, so I don't want to go to details of the proof, but there is an example where the two constants differ from each other. Since they differ from each other, we kind of got the motivation to study CLSI because they are different. But we need more like motivation because the CL CLSI is more complicated. We want to know why we study it. What can we get by studying this new inequality? And actually it is quite useful because CLSI, it is stable under tensorization. So let's say we have a few uh, quantum, a family of quantum Markov semigroups, and we are going to tensor them together. And then the CLSI of the tensor product semigroup is going to be the infimum of CLSI of each quantum Markov semigroup. Yeah, and the proof of this is very, uh, 
is very short. You can try to do it by yourself. The key ingredient of this proof is data processing inequality. So data processing inequality is kind of well known in quantum information. It tells us the relative uh, entropy will be monotone uh, decreasing under uh, quantum channels. And uh, so, as I mentioned before, I want to generalize facial information and uh, relative entropy. And after generalizing everything, we still want to have this tensor stability. So we still need some data processing inequality for new facial information, new relative entropy. And uh, actually, we don't have this data processing inequality for uh, the, the facial information and the re for the relative entropy I defined, but I can I can uh, I can only find out some weak version of data processing inequality, which is enough to guarantee the uh, tensor stability. And uh, so now I just want to do some uh, example. I think the first piece of advice about presentation I got from my advisor was never go to details when you give talks. But for this, I just want to like kind of go to details because this proof is very neat. It's like a few line, just a few lines. And you can just see a proof of a, of a CLSI problem. And this CLSI problem is very simple. First, we have a large Van Noma algebra, and then we have a smaller one, and we can define the conditional expectation. You can think of this M as like a finite dimensional matrices, and um, the CLSI of I minus E is greater than or equal to one. And let's talk about the proof. So first, let's study with the definition of facial information. So this is the definition of facial information. Um, I just wrote down the definition. This is the first line. So that's the definition. And this, the first, I only have to do one thing. I'm going to subtract this term and then add it again. And next thing is, I'm going to group the first two terms together and I'm going to group the last two terms together. And for the first two terms, I can remove this E, the green, uh, the, the conditional expectation in green color, because we can remove it because it is inside the trace. And uh, E of rho, it is in the sub uh, algebra log of E of rho is still in the subalgebra. So we can, and the whole thing is in the trace. So we can remove the first the conditional expectation. And then we observe that the first two terms, it is actually the, the definition of relative entropy. And the last two terms, it is the definition of another relative entropy. And we know relative entropy is always non-negative. Then we can just throw away the second term. And the first ter term is just the relative entropy that appears in the CLSI. And then we just obtain the inequality. The constant is one. But this constant, it is not optimal. Uh, it should be like, uh, so the optimal constant might be two uh, for some examples, but this is good enough because the proof is really short. And finally, we got some idea of CLSI. And this is the only simple example that I know uh, about CLSI. Uh, so now I also want to talk about some uh, generalization of CLSI. So the CLSI, uh, the, the relative entropy and the facial information, uh, they are both defined using natural log function. So the question is, can we just replace the natural log function by some other functions? The answer is yes. So first we need to generalize facial information, uh, relative entropy and the facial information. Here, I'm going to define this a new relative entropy. It is, um, 
defined as like the first uh, uh, the first uh, order Taylor expansion. Yeah, and the uh, facial information is defined as A of rho F prime of rho. So the first thing is the facial information and the relative entropy, they still satisfy the De Bruijn uh, formula. So we can say something about them, they are related. And also facial information here, it is positive if F is convex. Yeah, and uh, facial information is also, is also positive. If we let F be X natural log X, we can just, uh, these two definitions will re uh, reduce to the definitions we've seen before. Yeah, and uh, a good example of this F is the monomial function for P between one and two. And then we can just, uh, repeat the study of before, and we can basically um, uh, achieve the same results as before. Yeah, and this, so we can also define like, uh, like some quasi CLSI, uh, quasi MLSI, we can say the, we want to study something like facial, oh, sorry, there is a, a lighter missing. There should be a lambda. We want to study uh, lambda relative lambda p relative entropy smaller than p facial information, and also we can we can define the corresponding complete version of this inequality. And uh, so the study of this kind of inequality is necessary because first we don't have to deal with the natural log function. Uh, we can just study the p norm of some operators, and it is stronger than CLSI. And uh, the, the so this is also called the Beckner inequality for the commutative cases and the relation between Beckner inequality and uh, uh, MLSI was studied. I think uh, there was a paper from two years ago, I don't remember, but there was a paper um, studying uh, the relations between uh, Beckner inequality, Poincare inequality, CL, uh, MLSI, and also LSI. Okay, so now I just want to summarize some recent results. Um, sorry, any questions so far? Uh, why P is between one and two? Um, so here we want to let P between one and two because we want to study some, um, we want to guarantee this function is convex, but for, and also in the, the so first, this is convex. We want to make sure it is convex. So the uh, F relative entropy will be positive, but it cannot be larger than two because when we actually study this problem, we want to make sure this function is also operator convex. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, and another thing is, this is the only example that uh, I can find, which uh, this is the only example I can find where we can define or where we can study um, the complete version of such functional inequalities. I don't know any other functions which satisfy we, where we can define those inequalities. So it is also like a, gonna be very interesting to find out or to characterize all functions, all such F functions. Uh, and then let me just summarize some recent results. Um, so uh, we want- oh, see, I have another question. For some concrete, uh, um, operators A, you might know the sharp constant lambda or not? Um, I'm sorry, uh, what's the question again? For some concrete semigroups, for some concrete A, mm -hmm. do you know like sharp constants in this uh, um, Beckner inequality? So, so for some A, we can, we know some really good constants, but we, 
for some for some semi groups, we know they are not sharp. For some semi groups, we know they are good enough because we obtain constants which are the same as MLSI. Okay. I'm going to mention that for in the summary of the results. Okay, thank you. But thank you for the question. So then I'm going to summarize the results. Um, so today I just want to focus on linear blood operators and the CLSI of linear blood operator was studied by two groups. So the result was actually done independently by two groups, by uh, Legal, uh, Marius Junger and me, and also by Legal and the Combis. So we used the completely different methods. So there are two approaches. The first one is geometric one geometric uh, approach. The second one is algebraic approach. Yeah, and they both have some like, um, so um, advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, and today I want to focus on our like approach. Uh, maybe I can just ignore this part. Oh, sorry. Uh, I want to mention a few more things. So, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mention the result. So the result is, Every uh, Malkov, every uh, linear blood operator, every finite dimensional symmetric linear blood operator satisfies CLSI. And here we can only prove the existence because um, this is more like the existence result if, we, if you didn't specify uh, V, the matrix, we can, we can only guarantee the existence. And, um, that's the result. So and so, the, the next question is: Can we get some con uh, concrete concrete estimates of the CLSI? The answer is yes. We can get some concrete estimates for some linear blood operators. And those linear blood operators, they are defined in terms of a graph. So first, we are going to consider a connected graph with some vertices, may uh, V sub one, V sub two to V sub N. And then we can define uh, some asymmetric uh, matrix like X sub E. And then we can do X, the capital X sub capital E is gonna be a family of such asymm asymmetric uh, matrices. And then we can define the linear blood operators. And for such linear blood operators, we can give uh, some estimates of the constant. And the constant of this linear blood operator, the CLSI constant of this linear blood operator, it is upper and the lower bounded by the CLSI of the Laplace operator on the graph. So now, uh, the study of CLSI of the linear blood operator will boil down to the study of CLSI constant on the graph. And for the graph, there is a very, um, very neat proof because we can just prove it by observing the graph. And um, sorry, let me go back to last page one more time. So here we want to know some concrete estimates of the term in between. And it is enough to get some concrete estimates of, the, uh, of this CLSIG, which is the CLSI constant on the graph. And now I want to mention something about that. So the proof is very simple. This is a graph and it is a connected graph. The first thing we are going to do is to remove some unnecessary edges, which is the edge between two and three. We are going to make it a, a, a tree. This is a tree. And the next thing to do is we are going to, to, the, to this is also called the spanning tree of the graph. And then we are going to generate a cyclic graph out of the spanning tree. What we do is we are going to start from the, the root, like from one. And what we do is we go from one to two, 
and this is one. This is the first time we visit this. We we visit this uh, vertex. Vertex. It is one a the first time, and then we go to two. It's the first time we've ever visited visited two. So it's called two a. And then we go to four. It's called four. And then we go back to two. It's called two b. The next thing is we are going to visit five. It's five, and then go back to two. It's two c because it's the third time. And then we go back to one. It's going to be one one b the second time. And then we go back go to three, and then go back to one. So that's how we gener generate this cyclic graph.、Um, and actually, there is、uh, some algorithm that、uh, to to generate to to to. Uh, generate this cyclic graph. But why do we need this cyclic graph? The the story is the CLSI of the first graph. It can be bounded by the CLSI of the second graph, and then it can be bounded by the CLSI of the cyclic graph. So, but why do we study cyclic graph? Because cyclic graph it is almost a sphere. It is almost the the periodic functions on zero one. So that is to say, it is continuous again. The study of discrete things or discrete functions is always challenging. So we want to transfer everything from discrete to continuous. And then we can use some other tricks to somehow、uh, connect the CLSI of the cyclic graph. And the CLSI of periodic functions on the interval.、Um, so now I want to summarize. So that is to say, I want to go back to this.、Um, I mentioned two types of the results. The first is the existent result. The second is more like a concrete estimate result. The first result, it is also the key lemma is also the study of periodic functions on zero one. This is the key lemma we used in our geometric approach, and you also see like in for the concrete estimate example, we also need to study periodic functions on zero one. So. The study of an open quantum system, or the study of this kind of matrix, or the study of graph, they all boil down to the study of periodic functions on zero one, or we can say they all boil down to the study of CLSI on Riemannian manifolds. So that's also why we spend a lot of time studying the complete version of LSI on Riemannian manifolds.、Um, this is the first result we've ever got on CLSI, like、uh, our first result.、Um, so、um, there is a, a famous celebrated theorem in LSI. It's called the Baker-Emery criterion. It tells us for every、um, Uh, for for a、uh, compact Riemannian manifolds、uh, with positive Ricci curvature, we can、uh, the LSI is bounded by the lower bound by、uh, the Ricci curvature, which is the Baker-Emery criterion. And here we got the same thing. We basically recaptured the famous Baker-Emery criterion. So、uh, that criterion it also remains. For complete LSI, and more importantly, it remains for the p version of the complete、uh, inequalities. But it this is not enough for periodic functions because、uh, the periodic functions they are different. We want to study periodic functions on zero one, and the zero one it is flat. It, the Ricci curvature is not positive; it's actually zero. And as for that, we are going to do some small tricks, like to make sure、uh, we're just going to do some small tricks. And、uh, th this is nothing special. So、um, we, we are going to say that 
the, the flight measure is really close to another measure, which makes this manifold uh, positively curved. Yeah. So I want to spend more time on the open problems. Um, first, I want to answer the question from, uh, I don't know who asked the question. The question is optimal constant. So let's go back to the bakery emery uh, theorem. So whenever the result where the constant is sharp for a classical case, it will also be sharp for uh, non-commutative or uh, for the complete cases because we got the same bakery emery criterion. So they are the same. If the classical is sharp, the complete version is also sharp. But there is another question, like um, the CLSI on zero one, the periodic functions on zero one, this, this constant is not sharp. But for the classical case, I don't remember what, what it is. I think it's written in many uh, textbooks. They are sharp for classical cases, but they are not sharp here. And I don't know what the sharp constant is but we know this is not sharp. Yeah, and this is also one of the open problems. The second open problem, uh, we want to figure out the optimal constant of Laplace operator on periodic functions. And um, there are, the first open problem is also like, I've been thinking about it for a long time. So it is, does CLSI imply CLSI plus? So for the classical case, that is to say LSI or MLSI, it will imply MLSI plus or modified logarithmic inequalities will imply Beckner inequalities, which was um, the which is the result of the paper from two years ago or a year and a half ago. But do we have this result for a complete version? And this is open. Another thing is, uh, can we find other f? So in the generalized inequalities, I can only study things for f uh, defined for, for, for f equals to x to p, where p is between one and two. But can we find other functions which also like which also makes sense like we can also define everything um, this is also very difficult and the last problem is clsi of sub laplace operator on compact riemannian manifolds so the mlsi or lsi of sub laplace operator on compact riemannian manifolds has been well studied it was um the the, the existence result was given by Zingolaski uh, in 2007, I, I'm not sure, uh, by using hypercontractivity. But hypercontractivity doesn't, um, doesn't work or it doesn't have a nice analog uh, for the complete version. And we cannot use that tool anymore. So, that is to say, we need some new tools to find out the existence of such CLSI. And uh, um, so there is another story about this. I think it was the uh, two or three years ago, actually maybe four years ago, one of my, uh, my collaborator, Li Gao, announced they find out, they solved this problem and right after QIP, they realized that they made a mistake and they didn't solve the problem. And I think my whole PhD, uh, I basically spent my whole PhD trying to solve this problem together with my advisor. And we failed and failed um, over and over again. Uh, recently, we feel like, uh, we feel like we solved the problem again, um, but I mean, no one knows. So, we will see whether the proof works or not. I invite you to think about this problem. I mean, at this point, I just want to see a proof that works. 
I don't mind like uh, that someone else proved proves the result. I just want to see the proof, but I don't encourage uh, PhD students uh, to work on this problem or just do not spend too much time on this problem. Um, so that's it. And thank you for your attention. And again, I will move to Germany this fall. So um, if you want to invite me to give a talk at your institute or you want to visit me, please tell me, please let me know as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Paul Jian, for the clear presentation. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I, I have maybe a stupid question. When you uh, reduce your sort of non-commutative problem to the problem on the manifold, that, should we understand this like you reduce a non-commutative problem to commutative problem? Mm -hmm. So, yes, let me go back to the definition uh, of CLSI. Um, so this is, this is the definition. So here, uh, if we only focus on the first part, this is the same as LSI or MLSI. So for the manifold, MLSI and LSI, they are equivalent. Yeah, and the, the first definition, this is the same as the classical case. By saying reduce, I mean, uh, we are going to drop the second problem, like, or we are going to let F, this F be complex numbers. Mm -hmm. okay. And another question, I uh, familiar with the classical um, logarithmic sobel of inequality where the main thing that it can be used, for example, for measure concentration results. Mm -hmm. And how about this non-commutative stuff? Uh, so that's also like, um, um, that's also a, 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 like uh, some issue we have, like, um, uh, to be honest, it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't promote the study of classical analysis that much. It's more like the, uh, so it, it does, I don't know any, um, I don't know that many connections between this and the concentration phenomena. Um, I, so my understanding is this itself is very interesting mathematically, um, but it does have many applications to physics. It is related to decoherence phenomena but for mathematically people, we will claim that there are many applications, but they are not that useful for classical analysis. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't think it's a good answer, but I think that's my like honest <laughs> response. Uh, but one thing I think it might help is our, if our proof, uh, recently, we got a new proof, um, the last uh, open problem. If our proof works, maybe uh, the, the, the approach will help, will, will, will be useful because, oh, I cannot disclose details, but uh, we give a, like a new proof of the CLSI. And the proof is very short. It is shorter than the proof given by Zingolaski via hypercontractivity. So maybe that the, the method or the machinery in that proof will be useful, but if it works, I, I cannot say more. Thank you. Thank you. Hojan, one question. You had this CLSI on graphs is upper bounded by CLSI of cyclic. Mm -hmm. cyclic graph, right? Uh, and there was this graph Laplace and on the previous slide, you had inequality at CLSI, yes. Is it true for graph? Ah, okay, okay. The, okay. Okay, now I understand. Okay, I just wanted to see this slide. Okay, any other questions? One remark that uh, logarithmic Sobolev inequality is used not only for concentration, measure concentration, that probabilist promote. I think in Perelman's proof of Poincare conjecture, it was used three times. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay. If there are no any questions, then let's thank the speaker again. Thank and you for having me.